still preaching that the economies should be self-stabilizing and shouldn't need this policy action. So there's a, there's a fundamental conflict with that, and I, I'll come back to that because that's related to what economists these days used to refer to as the great moderation. This is something that Bernanke has talked about particularly. Um, so the core of the problem is to understand whether it's basically the financial instability argument of Keynes and Minsky that's right, or if it's Friedman's stability argument that is fundamentally right and that we are uh, making mistakes with monetary policy. Now, I think to get to that question, the first thing we need to do is think about the, the structure of the monetary system uh, at the most fundamental level. Uh, in the book, what I talk about is three flavors of money. I call them money, anti-money, and fiat money. Uh, and the point I want to make with those three flavors of money is that we have two quite distinct forms of monetary creation that can go on in an economy. We have monetary creation in the private sector by the banking system. And what basically happens there when a bank makes a loan is it gives money to someone taking the loan, and in return, the person taking the loan effectively gives a letter of credit or a, a debt back to the bank. And that's what I call the money and the anti-money. The credit creation process creates money and debt at the same time. When you're in a credit expansion phase, the volume of money and debt rises. That's what monetary expansion is. When you're in a credit cre contraction phase, those debts gradually get paid down and it contracts. And these can produce waves of inflation and deflation in the economy. And that's what we saw in the last uh, couple of decades. We had a, a major monetary expansion and we had a wave of asset price inflation. Not goods price inflation, but asset price inflation. That's now reversing and we're going into the contractionary phase. There's then a secondary uh, channel through which money is created these days, and that is what's known as the fiat money. And that is that the central banks, or the, the government rather, can print money. Now, the interesting difference between the private sector creating money and the state sector creating money is that when the private sector creates money, it creates debt to go alongside it. When the state sector creates money, it doesn't bother creating debt to go with it. So, private sector creates waves of inflation and deflation. The state sector creates one-way inflation. And this is why there's a lot of confusion over monetary policy, because you have two structures. You have an underlying inflation, and then these big wobbles on top of that underlying inflation. And it's not well understood that they're actually two distinct processes. And that, that leads to some confusion. Um, so with that basic sort of understanding of money, I'd then like to just compare two different market structures. I would, uh, I would criticize the, the mainstream th uh, thought process on market structures as being too, um, too much in awe of Adam Smith and his analysis. If you read Adam Smith, he talks about efficient markets. But if you look at what he's really st uh, studying, is he's studying the markets for goods and services, for things that are being traded. And he makes a very plausible argument for why those markets are efficient. And by that, he means how supply and demand works. If we're talking about a goods market, if the demand for a good goes up, then it pushes the price up. The higher price makes it more profitable to manufacture those goods, so more suppliers come in to enjoy that profit. And by moving the price of the good, you bring supply and demand into perfect equilibrium. I think that's a, it's a very plausible story. It's why free trade is a great idea. It's the core of most economic thinking. The problem I think we've done, we've made, is that we've fallen into the trap of assuming we can apply that same logic into the asset markets, 
particularly into the debt finance markets. Now, if we think about how an asset market works, there's a few core differences between what's going on in assets and good goods markets. To start with, when a fund manager, I'm a fund manager, when a fund manager buys an asset, they're frequently looking for something called scarcity value. That means they're looking for an asset whose supply cannot be increased in proportion to, to demand because they want it to go up in price. So by the nature of investment, investors are seeking out situations where the law of supply and demand cannot work. That was part of the reason for the oil price increase. People thought there was going to be a shortage of oil, so we got this self-feeding speculative bubble in oil. But that's just, that's just part of the, the dynamic. The more important instability in financial markets comes from the interplay between mark-to-market -market accounting and the debt finance structure of those markets. Now, if you think about what happens when a, an investor holds a portfolio of assets funded with debt, if the price of those assets starts to increase, then the value of the portfolio will rise relative to his stock of debt. That will allow him then to borrow more money that will allow him to buy more assets, which will allow him to buy, borrow more money, which will allow him to buy more assets, which will allow him to borrow more money. This is what's, what mathematicians refer to as a positive feedback cycle. That is where events in the past influence events in the future in a self-reinforcing manner. We've seen that in the housing market, we've seen it in, in the UK, we've seen it in the US in the housing market, whereby people were buying houses on a speculative basis, or buy to let. The purchase of those houses were, push, sorry, were pushing up the price of the market generally, which was allowing other people to withdraw equity from their houses and make additional purchases themselves. It's, a, it's basically a problem of the mark-to-market -market accounting issue with the marginal pricing issue. If you think about what happens when we trade one house in a street, say there's 100 houses in the street, they're all valued at $100,000, but then somebody trades one house at $110,000. The other 99 homeowners then think they're $10,000 richer. So that one small transaction creates a feeling of wealth on a much larger scale. Then when the banks come in to lend against them, they will judge the value of those houses against that last marginal transaction. So you can get a situation, theoretically, let's say we go out and we buy one share in a company, and we buy that one share for just a few dollars, but we buy it at 10% above the market that will make an appearance of a huge capital gain for all other shareholders in the system, which allows credit creation to flow into the system, which then allows more borrowing and more purchases. Unfortunately, it all works in reverse as well. When you get a capital loss, you see, throwing money away. <laughs> Shouldn't do that. Uh, not even fiat money. Um, so when you... When you get the capital losses, the, market, the, the banks then go back to the borrowers and say, sorry, we need a margin call from you now. We need you to put up more assets for your borrowing. Frequently, 